Bibles, if you would, to Psalm chapter 35. Psalm chapter 35. I had to eventually uh, go past Psalm 34, and it pained me to do so. Like I mentioned along this, during the series, Psalm 34 is probably my favorite chapter in the Bible. And after four weeks or so, I figured I probably should go to Psalm 35. And I didn't want to, and uh, I could have preached another, boy, I don't know, 20, 30 messages out of Psalm 34 and would have enjoyed every one of them, but I must for time's sake and for uh, cohesion with the series Keep On Moving. And I think you'll find in Psalm 35 some help for us tonight, um, just, I think, some practical truth. I, I love how the Bible is intensely practical in our life. I try to bring it that way as well because the Bible is not just some book to be put on a shelf. And to be admired, though it is to be admired, it's a book that's to be read and to be followed. If it's not practical, all right, then it's not helpful, but Jesus gave us practical truth. God gave us practical truth that will help us tonight, even though it was written thousands and thousands of years ago, because it's the Word of God and supernatural, it'll help us in what we're going through right now. And that's what God's Word does. It touches us if we let it. We can hinder the Word of God. We can sit here with distracted minds and hardened hearts, and, and the Bible calls that fallow or hard ground. Jesus gave us that illustration in the New Testament about soil and, and the sower who sowed some seed. And our heart can be hard ground, or it can be tender and supple, and the Word of God can turn it up. And we ought always to come to church and open the Bible and every day with the mindset, God, turn up my heart or touch me, and we ought to respond to it. And follow it. And so tonight, as we look at Psalm 35, uh, we'll look at some truth in the same light. And I hope and pray that you'll respond to God as He touches you. And I hope He touches you regularly. All right? I don't want to go weeks and weeks without God touching me. I want God to speak to me and show me from His Word. And I want to respond to it. As a pastor, I want to be growing in the Word. As a Christian, I want to be growing in grace. And hopefully, I'm a better Christian than I was five years ago. Right? Not because of me, but because of him and my response to him. And that ought to be a goal we ought to have to be closer to God tomorrow than we are today and to not settle for anything else than that. And at church is one avenue, one way that we open God's word and have him speak to us. And I appreciate you being here. You're so faithful and you're diligent and you're just a great church to pastor. I love the fact that I can be here, that I can raise my family here. So thankful that I can point to men and women in this auditorium and point my kids to their example and say, look at that man, look at that lady, Johnny, James, Daniel. You can follow them as they follow Jesus Christ. And that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And, uh, and listen, as a pastor, I probably know more dirt than anyone else in the room. And that's about me, myself. And I tell you what, I tell you what, I love this church. Because God's doing something right here. It's not us, it's him. He's doing something in Bridgeport and Saginaw. We want to be faithful to him. So let's make sure as we look at the word of God, we respond to it. I say that to say this, we still have an old-fashioned altar up here. An old-fashioned invitation. You know some churches don't have an invitation any longer? At the end of the service, they close it out with a word of prayer and say, as God spoke to you, respond to him. Now, I'm, as God speaks, we are to respond to him. But we still have an old-fashioned altar with an old-fashioned invitation and invite people to respond to the Lord in the old-fashioned way. We bend the knee and say, God, you touch me and change me. Well, Psalm 35 tonight, and uh, I know that, that this will hit home a little bit uh, to some people because yesterday there was a, a game. And uh, I think it was like a, uh, I don't know, some type of flag football game, something like that. And uh, for those who are cheering for Ohio, I am deeply saddened with your loss. And uh, I'll be at the altar because I'm lying. I'm not sad at all about that loss. Uh, but if you were to notice in the game, and sports brings this out, sometimes people get offended. You ever notice that? People get offended. When I mean, there's a big rivalry going on, people will say things they never ought to say, and people get offended. But forget sports for a moment. People get offended just by living in life. Sometimes accidentally, sometimes on purpose. I read a story about an evangelist. He was a good evangelist. He was warm-hearted and kind. And he was in a meeting, and he saw this nice Cadillac in the, in the parking lot, and he went up to the man in the Cadillac and said, Man, what a beautiful car. Beats walking, doesn't it? What he didn't realize is the man was a paraplegic. And he had special things installed in the car just so he could drive around that had graciously been provided for him so when he said that which to any of us would have not caused offense to this man in the car caused great offense and it wasn't even on purpose have you ever offended somebody and it wasn't on purpose i won't ask if you have on purpose because we've all done that we know that's the case as well but have you ever been offended 
Have you ever had someone come after you? Someone who wished malfeasance for you and wished that bad things would happen and, and really just didn't want you to succeed or excel? Perhaps at work they had, a, they had an axe to grind against you. Perhaps in a relationship they just got mad at you. Perhaps at school they said, you're the one I don't like. And, and sometimes you may know why that is and sometimes you may not know why that is, but there's a fence there. And in this psalm, David is going to bring to us a way to fight offenses. I wish I could bring you just a sermon on, on how to win at the offense and, uh, and give you just something like, uh, you know, take him out back in the back alley, one, two, three, you're done. Because that would make our flesh feel better. We'd feel really good. But it wouldn't please the Lord, would it now? And tonight, Psalm 35, David's going to challenge us on how we fight offenses. I have entitled the message, two simple words, his fight. His fight. Now, you know where I'm going, so some of you ought to be in the altar right now. Because some of you have been fighting your own fights. But David is going to say, listen, God, I want you to fight my fight. Let's read just the first couple of verses, and we'll ask the Lord's help on this time. David says, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Lord, as we come to your word tonight... I ask for your help. No doubt in the heart in our life there are offenses that will come. That sometimes they're not our fault. That we did nothing to orchestrate or to damage, but Lord, yet there are offenses and there are battles. And we're tempted to fight. Lord, we're tempted to defend ourselves. And tonight, Lord, as we look at your word, help us to see how you will fight for us. And to rest in you. We ask for your help and blessing during this time, and we ask that everything that you want to accomplish would be accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, offended people can be divided into two categories. Those that have been offended and wronged, and those that think they have been wronged. And truth be told, I've been in both categories before. There have been times when I've truly been wronged. And I could give you documentation, I could give you examples, I could give you stories, and I could tell you how I was wronged. We remember those if we're not careful very, very well. I can remember teachers in school that falsely accused me. Accused me of talking out of turn. Can you believe that? Now, they didn't catch me the times I actually was doing that, but there were those one or two times in all my years of schooling that I actually wasn't talking at the wrong time. And I was wronged. And then there are those who have, those who believe they have been wronged. Those who assume, this person has offended me. And you hear their story, you hear their explanation, and you think to yourself, wow, you have made a mountain out of a molehill. And then, look at this text, look at this text. How do you read that text? And you read it in a not offensive way. And what does that person usually say? Well, it could be that, but I think it means this right here. Those who think they have been wronged. You see, there's times we're wronged, there are times we think we have been wronged. And there are personal offenses. Often, when someone is personally offended, personally attacked, they take on the offense. They begin to fight their own battles, whether it be verbally defending themselves, whether it be by recruiting others to assist them in their cause. Well, what do you think about this situation? If it were you, what would you do? Recruiting, recru recruiting those to help them. And maybe you've been guilty of this before. Now, with the advent of social media, it becomes infinitely easier to recruit those who will stand with you in your personal offense. Asking for a friend, what would you say to this? You can read right through them, can't you? You know what they're doing. 
They're personally fighting their offense, a personal offense when I take on my own offense. People become consumed with justifying their own motivations, begin to explain their own decisions. And Jesus said that offenses will come. There's battles and strife. Just by living in this world, there will be problems. And the temptation is to fight them yourself. And if you are guilty and, and, and fall guilty to this trap, you will spend the majority, I dare say most, if not almost all of your time, trying to put out all the offenses. And running down this offense and running over here and recruiting help over here and trying to explain this situation. And it is a tedious and stressful task. And at the end, you step back and then you begin to believe that everyone is against you. And everyone has an angle and everyone's out to just destroy you. You maybe have met someone like this before. And every turn, every situation, they're instantly on the aggressive side. Because they know that that was another offense. And that waiter was offending them. And that cashier who never met them before was literally just doing their job. I'm thankful for those who are still checking out people at Walmart. I'm against self-checkout, I think. <laughs> Yet even then, as a complete stranger, like, well, that person. And then someone turns in front of them in the road. They cut me off on purpose. They see offense every single place they look. It's no way to live. It's no way to live. Not only is there personal offense, there's shared offenses. That's when I begin to take on offenses for other people. It could be for family. What do they say? Blood is thicker than water. And I tell you, family, that can, that can pull some heartstrings, can it not? Boy, you can pick on my family, but... I'm sorry, I can pick on my family, but you can't pick on my family. Some will say, I'll swing for family. And shared offenses is when you take on offense for a family member. And now a wife is mad for her husband's sake, and a husband for a wife, and a, and a mom for her child. Welcome to being principal for 12 years. Shared offenses. No way to live carrying everyone else's offenses because, again, all you're doing is battling and battling and, and your adrenaline and stress goes out the window and you're, just, you're, you're in this, this fight mode all of the time. There's no joy in life. There's definitely no peace in life, and yet peace is a fruit of the Spirit. It ought to be evident and it ought to be a marker of a, someone's walk with God, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And yet there's offenses all around us and those who take them personally and fight their own battles, those who carry them for others, and I'm just being a good friend and, and defending them for them. And here in Psalm chapter 35, we have another way to fight offenses. And I'll call it God's way or his fight. Now we'll look at, look at tonight three ways that, that David asks and looks to have his offense fought. Now i got to tell you, if I had to choose, I'd rather someone else fight my offense than me. It does kind of make you feel good when, when someone falsely accuses you and, and others come to your rescue, does it not? It makes you kind of feel like, wow, there's, there's some neat things when others stand for, for, for my cause. But it's even greater when the God of the universe will embark on your behalf. Because no one can answer him. No one can stop God Almighty. He is unstoppable. He is unshakable. He has a word which strikes right through the thoughts and intents of the heart. And when he fights a battle, my friend, it's over. But here's what I've learned. That God will not fight my battle if I'm fighting it. He'll let me fight it. He'll let me get all but out of shape. He'll let me get all worked up, all anxious. And he'll just sit there. God won't fight my battle if I let others fight it. But if I follow his word, God will fight my battle for me. Now, i got to tell you something before we get into the three ways to let them fight our battle. 
he doesn't always fight it the way that I want him to fight it. You with me so far? Oh, I got some great plans how God can fight my battles for me. Come on now, you're with me. Someone cuts you off, God fight my battle and have a police officer pull them over right now. Come on, how many, how many have thought that before? Come on, they speed past you, come on. And how many have seen a car speed past you, pulled over a little bit, and you've had a joyful, gleeful attitude? You filthy, rotten pagans, at the invitation time, you better be up here right here. God doesn't always fight the battles like I want him to fight. Sometimes a hurt comes. In my flesh, Lord, hurt them back. So my flesh says. Come on, now my flesh says that, and so does yours. God doesn't always fight my battles like I want him to fight, but if I let him, he will fight my battles for me. And he fights them thoroughly, and he fights them completely. Let's see what David says tonight and how we let God fight our battles. It starts in verse number 1. In verse number 1 through 12, we see a big section of Scripture where David is just pleading with God. He starts with this, God, I plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. The first way to let God fight our battles is, number one, to rest, to rely upon him. This whole, this whole first section, verses 1 through 12, you will hear David ask for certain things. God, fight them this way. Let them be confused and confounded. God, there's false witnesses. They've lied about me. But God, please fight for me. I'm innocent. I'm falsely accused. But God, please fight for me. In verse number 9, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. I'm resting in you. And if we're going to let God fight our battles, we have to rely on him. Or, I'll say it this way, take your hands off the wheel. Get your foot off the gas. Step away from the fire with the can of gasoline. Now, you ought not play with gasoline and fire. We know that, right? And in life, you ought not play with offenses and you fighting your own battles. Far more devastating than what can happen on a real fire and a can of gasoline is my flesh dealing with offenses. Far more damaging, far more destructive far more hurtful and painful, not only to me, but those I'm dealing with. And here David says, God, I'm going to rely on you. And you've got it. And Lord, in case you missed it, I'm going to tell you all the things they've done to me. Boy, they've fought against me. They're trying to destroy me. They've lied against me. They've bore false witness. All these things. And so, Lord, listen, here's the situation. You better take care of it. My friend, let God... Let God fight your battle. So take your foot off the gas and your hand off the wheel. And quit leaning on other people. When you lean on other people, it's like you're using training wheels. Now, training wheels may be helpful for a little bit of time when you ride a bike. to keep it from falling. But I've never seen anyone enter the Tour de France with training wheels on. You know why? Because they just hinder you and slow you down. Lance Armstrong in his glory days of uh, cheating, uh, uh, seven times I think it was, uh, he didn't enter and say, hey boys, all right, strap on the extra wheels, this will be good. No, no, no. And when we try to do these own things, it's like we're strapping training wheels to what God can and wants to do. So number one, rely on him. Take those hands off the wheel. Take that foot off the gas. Do you ever feel like God doesn't work fast enough? God, let me give you a little nudge in the gas. Right here, okay, Lord, right now, right now. And I'm not talking about in this, I'm talking about all aspects of life. When I have a need, I have a problem, I want God to work right now. As soon as I realize it, the solution, I think, ought to be right there. Now, sometimes God works that fast. He can. There's sometimes you get an answer to prayer, and, and when you put the, time, uh, the timeline together, you realize God answered it before you even had the problem. And it's awesome. But it's just as awesome to learn to wait on the Lord and to learn to be patient and to rejoice when things happen. That's what James talks about. Because the trying of my faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting in nothing. You want to be a mature Christian? Let God work in his time. 
and be content with it. So in the offense, number one, rely on God. That means when I'm tempted to pick up my phone, I ought to pick up the line to heaven instead. When I'm tempted to post, I better set some time to pray. Rely on God. When I'm tempted to talk about it at church, let me tell you what happened. I ought to rely on him. At school, at work, boy, my flesh rears its ugly head and so does yours. I begin to fight my own battles and justify myself and vindicate my motivations and my actions. Rely on the Lord. That's what David says, verses 1 through 12. Lord, I rest, I rely, I plead with you to plead my cause and fight for me. Number two, if God's going to fight our battles. Number two, we see this, beginning verse number 13. We're going to see this concept, not only do we rely on him, but number two, focus on worshiping him. This will be with our actions. Look what he says in verse 13, but as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. Verse 14, I behaved myself as though he had been a friend or brother. I bowed down heavily. So you look through these verses, you're going to see that David is in a mournful state, but he begins to worship. His actions have changed. Instead of swinging verbally or swinging mentally or swinging physically, he begins to worship. He begins to do things that please the Lord. Just imagine for a moment if every time you were offended, you worshiped God. Your worship would be unmatched in this world. If every time someone said a crossword, you took a moment to pray, your prayer life would be unmatched in this church. If every time someone cut you off in traffic, you worshiped God. You humbled yourself. You fasted. If every time that we were offended, we fasted, we'd all weigh a lot less, wouldn't we? What if every time we're offended, instead of reacting and doing, we worshiped? See, David had the right idea. He said, I, I have to focus not on this, but on this right here. And my actions, my actions will reflect what my mind is saying. The proverb says this, commit thy works under the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Instead of spending your time plotting and weeping and sorrowing and pining away, looking for revenge or vindication, spend your time in worship. You see, worship may not change your surroundings, but it'll change your mind. You know that we're called in one sense, to be telescopes. Teleco telescopes take something that is seemingly out of reach and brings it right here. And imagine what your workplace would look like if you take the grace of God in the fence and bring it right here for everyone else. Imagine what your family would look like if you bring God's grace seemingly out of reach and bring it right here. You see, he began to do the things that would please the Lord. I've often said our problem is not a knowing problem. Our problem is a doing problem. Most of us know enough about what God wants us to do to do right until Jesus comes back. But that doesn't mean we do it. That just means we know it. And something about when offenses come... Boy, if we're not careful, it all flees out of our mind and we revert back to our ugly old flesh. It says, you know what, I'm going to vindicate myself. And we begin to plot and to scheme and to think about how that revenge will be, will be sweet. And yet David says, I ask God to fight for me and I rely on him. And number two, I worship. But number three, number three, found in verse 18 through 28, and really summed up in the last two verses of the psalm, look please in verse 27 and 28, where the Bible says this, let them shout 
for joy. And be glad that favor my righteousness. Cause, yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of a servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. Throughout the book of Psalms, we have this concept of praise. And in offenses, people ought to still hear us praise. In our worship, that dealt with the actions. In our praise, that speaks to our verbal talk. David says, my mouth, let my mouth, I will shout for joy. My tongue shall speak. You see, David knows something. That this reflects this. Jesus said that for the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And as we speak praise, I tell you, 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 you can't really fake praise. You can try, people can see right through it. It ought to be a genuine praise. A praise to God, you're magnified. Whatever happens is okay. In our casual conversation, in our deliberate reflection, in our calculated answers, in our speech, it should point to Jesus Christ. I read about a man tonight, or this afternoon I'm sorry, I read about a man who hitchhiked. From coast to coast. He walked a large portion and rode part of the way. And someone asked him, a news reporter asked him, what was the greatest problem of the Coast Coast travel? And he said, it was the sand. The sand that got in my shoes. That rubbed my feet raw. Offenses are like that, aren't they? The little irritations. Sometimes they're big, but often they're just little. Just little things. A crossword, a sour look, a sideways glance. Part of the problem is we're so full of ourselves, we think everyone's doing things around us. You see people talking, they stop, and you think, they must be talking about me. I can promise you something, my friend, and in this church they're not talking about you. They're not. Well, they stopped right when I came up. Because you walked up on a conversation to think that everyone talks about you at church. I'm sorry, it doesn't happen here. They don't talk about me, they talk about you. But our pride says they're talking about me. Walking down the hallway and someone doesn't smile at you, it still happens to me. It's a, listen, people are like, Pastor, I think you're mad at me. Why? Because you didn't, you didn't smile at me when I walked past you in the hallway. Listen, friends, you will know if I'm mad at you. I give you my word, you will know. It's not going to be a sour look in the hallway. I'll tell you, I'm mad at you. Let's deal with this. If I don't smile at you past the hallway, it's probably like I'm doing something else in my mind. Maybe getting ready to preach. All right, I may be setting aside an offense because someone just offended me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it's the sand of life, isn't it? Little offenses that get inside our spirit and rub us the wrong way. And many good Christians have been hindered in service has been stopped. And church help has been stopped. And worship has been stopped. And praise has been stopped. Why? Because of offense. You see, when you're fighting your own battles, when I'm fighting my own battles, I'm not worshiping. I'm not praising. I'm fighting. I'm fighting. And that's my focus. When I have a shared offense... I'm not worshiping, I'm not praising, I'm not relying, I'm fighting. It consumes us. Yet David says, listen, listen here, God, you have to fight for me. God, this is now your fight. And remember this, our enemies are at work, on the road, sometimes at home. David, his enemies are out there trying to kill him. They literally tried to chop him to pieces. He had real cause to be concerned. I wonder if David came in tonight and he were to give us these words. King David, man of war. I wonder what he would say when we begin to explain our offenses to him. Well, David, let me tell you something. Yesterday, I was at Walmart. <laughs> what would David say, Really? My father-in-law tried to stick me to the wall with a javelin. And you're complaining about Walmart? Well, you don't understand. I was at church and someone didn't shake my hand. Really? 
The armies were coming after me. They trapped me in caves. They were chopping me to pieces. And someone didn't smile at you? Is that what you're fighting about? You don't understand, David. You don't understand. Listen, they were really, really mean. They hurt my feelings. They hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. After I left the priest, Saul came and slaughtered all of them. So when David comes and says, listen, I want God to fight my battles, he comes from a place of authority and experience. He comes from a place of reality that many of us will never face. So if it's good enough for King David, it's good enough for you and me. So when you're offended, not if, but when you're offended, rest in him. When you're offended, worship him. When you're offended, praise him. And it will become God's fight. And he has a way of fighting that confounds the mighty, that defeats the strong, that vindicates his servants. It won't be always when you want it. It won't always be how you want it. But it will be good and it will be right. So stop fighting. Let him fight.